So I've been playing a lot of UFC 4 with my roommate. And hey, <laughs> we be trying to knock each other heads off. Hey, and goofing off with him and running from our responsibilities, I had a realization. Oh, brother! <laughs> What is the fundamental difference between UFC and traditional fighting games? Today we're talking about trades and how trades define how we play fighting games. You see, in real life, if someone swings a slow but powerful haymaker punch and you hit them with a jab, their momentum will carry through and you will still get hit by them. However, on the other hand, if you throw a haymaker punch also, you have the same risk of getting hit yourself but you at least have the potential of knocking them out and ending the fight. So what's the point in throwing a jab if there's a high risk of getting clocked for it? This risk versus reward is why 6th grade fights in the bathroom consists of spamming haymakers and praying for a knockdown for additional poison damage. The fight something in the bathroom, no homo, we slipping on semen. However, in traditional fighting games, if your opponent winds up a haymaker or a heavy punch and you tap them with a fast light punch, you'll actually get a full combo. This small disconnect leads to the most common mistake people make in every single fighting game. Not being subscribed to one of the hottest channels on the come up. <clears throat> My bad. Pressing slow buttons too close to your opponent. Have you ever wondered why fighting games name the moves the way that they do? For example, in Street Fighter, you have light punches, medium punches, and heavy punches. In Tekken, you have ones, twos, and threes. In Guilty Gear, you have punch, kick, slash, heavy, slash, and in Blaze Blue, you have like ABCs. You might say the point of this is to be able to quickly communicate what moves we're talking about with another player instead of describing them. To that, I would say yes, absolutely. But how they classify moves are also the first insight on where you should be on the screen when you're using them or even thinking about them. What I'm saying is that generally you'll find that your A's, your ones, and your light punches should be used when you're up close to your opponent. Because in every game, they're going to be your fastest option despite having the shortest range. Your B's, your medium punches, and your twos in games should be used when you're at medium range from your opponent. Because they're going to be a little slower than your lights, but they're going to have a little bit more range on them. Your heavy punches, heavy slashes, C's and 3's should be used when you're even further from your opponent because they're going to have the most range and probably hit the hardest but also be the slowest in your arsenal. Generally this applies within games and across games so if you're playing one character and you're, you've learned that character and now you want to learn a new character the situations in which you press your punch button with that character is probably going to be the same in which you press the punch button with the other character. As long as we're talking about just generally those moves and not special properties of them, you'll find that across the board they're going to be the same. An even better way of putting this is, if you're a new player, unless you're looking to call out a very specific thing, you have no reason to even think about pressing another button when you're standing at this range other than your light punch, other than your jab, other than your one. If you press a slow button right next to your opponent, you will get smoked 9 out of 10 times because they aren't going to press a slow button right next to you. Taking this out of your mind allows you to focus on what matters when it matters. This concept of eliminating stuff from your mind isn't limited to just the buttons that you press like punch, kick, slash, and heavy slash, or light, medium, and heavy. It also applies to full live options such as like air dashing and special moves. So check this out. So I started teaching my little sister Guild to Gear Strive and I used a mini game that uses a lot of these concepts to help her really kind of sort out how to think about playing fighting games. Oh, hey, I got an idea. Let's make this into a mini game. We can make this into a mini game, yeah. The rules of the mini game was we were going to play out of certain range with a limited move set. If you land a hit on your opponent, that's one point. If you get your opponent to block your move, that's half a point. The first person to three points wins. What you want, the, what you have to look out for is this. So your options are to air dash, to down forward triangle. Well, how about it? How about it? No, down forward triangle. Down forward triangle. 
Okay. Don't worry, if you think I'm gonna air dash, you know what you gotta press? Forward square. That's the that's the anti-air. Forward. Yeah, so if I if I do this, you wanna press forward square. So one, two, three. You see what happens? Same thing for you. You can air dash. Go so you go for air dash. I can do that to you also. But the key is if I gun flame, you know what you gotta do? You gotta air dash over it. I want you to do down forward triangle. I can do that to you. That's what the air dash is for. Round three one. points. First person to three points win. Fight. Alright. Alright, that's no point. You should have attacked me. You would have got a, you got half a point. Alright, reset. Ready? Go. That's one point for me. Just reset, reset, reset. Alright, ready? Go. Yeah, that's half a point for me. Cause you had to block, so that's one and a half points. That's, that's two and a half points. I only need one, only need one more point. Alright, no point, no point, no point. We gotta reset, we gotta reset. Yeah. Alright, ready, go. Alright, that's half a point for you. So half a point to two and a half. Ready, go. Alright, it's my power one. But, but you see how we did points? Normally, instead of points, it would be a combo. And then whoever has more points wins. So there's three main takeaways from this mini game. First, that in fighting games, there's two modes you're going to be operating in. You're going to be operating in a proactive mode and a reactive mode. The proactive mode is when you're aggressively attacking your opponent or attacking the space. This is when you're going first in this neutral situation. The reactive mode is when you're waiting for your opponent to do something so you can respond second and respond with the appropriate response to punish them. The important thing to realize is that because you have these two distinct modes, you can't do them both at the same time. If you decide to be proactive and do something, your character is not in a position to react to whatever your opponent does. And if you're being reactive, then your opponent doesn't have to deal with your pressure of you doing something proactive. Great players are going to quickly switch between the two, but the important thing to realize is that there is a switch that's happening there, and that being able to recognize which mode that you're in and which mode your opponent in becomes very important. The second thing that this minigame teaches us is that anticipation is more important than reaction times. Everything in the game is so much easier to deal with when you're expecting it to come or you're looking out for it. The last thing this minigame teaches you is respect and risk and the fact that deciding to do an action without thinking about it will put you in harm's way if your opponent knows the counter to it. I think this is a great starting point for anyone, but in a real match people will weave in and out of different ranges to manipulate what you should be considering to make you mess up. This will cause you to either wait longer than you want to or for you to even like whiff an entire attack that will get you punished. How does all of this connect back to how trades work in UFC with getting hit through your jabs? Like in traditional fighting games, straight punches, which are like your twos, will interrupt an attack. But a jab, which is like your one or your A, will not. Why does that happen? First, let's look at jabs. They break the rules of traditional moves in a case where it has good range and good speed. However, jabs are naturally balanced by lacking power, which is why it can't break or interrupt someone. This means that jabs or ones in real life are great initiators, not interrupters. This is because jabs are too fast to react to and have a very quick recovery, making them safe to whip. So let's look at when would you use the jab. They are meant for going first when you catch your opponent being defensive or reactive looking for your threatening options. If you use your punch or your jab while your opponent is being proactive or aggressive, you risk getting hit through your jab. Because your initiation tool and your interruption tool are tied to different moves, you have to be a little more intentional about this decision to go for them in UFC in comparison to other fighting games because any button you press will interrupt whatever they do. So revisiting the mini game I was using to teach my sister, she lost the first round by being too proactive. She was trying to use the horizontal projectile move which was giving me an opportunity to counterattack her. After that first round, we went to play again. Ready? Go. Ah, you got me. I 
that's all it's too late. That's one one for you. Because she's waiting for me to do something, if I take the risk of doing an air dash, I would just get anti-air. And if I do the risk of doing a projectile, she would just air dash over it. So an easier or lower risk option would be to just run up into attacker. While she was getting really into it, she had a question. That's half a point for me. Half a point, half a point, you blocked it. She said, why does blocking count as half a point? Another way of kind of framing this question for our conversation is, jabs don't do damage, why does it matter? Landing a jab or getting someone to block your attack puts you in control. Normally, you can't use heavy punches up close to your opponent like we talked about earlier. But once your opponent blocks the jab, it gives you the advantage to use those slower buttons or slower moves that were originally off limits. While initially it has a low risk for low reward, the jab creates a situation for a bigger payoff. Decreasing how often you go for high risk options in exchange for lower risk options is normally the key to building a reliable play style as you realize how quickly you can lose from depending on these risky options like air dashing. The ability to have advantage when making your opponent block after the proactive versus reactive mini game is why you hear fighting games are turn based. All this means is that after an opponent blocks something, they have to wait for their turn or the right moment to press something. And if they don't recognize it and press any button at that time, they will get hit and comboed. Doing consecutive attacks after you get your opponent to block is called a block string. Due to the risk versus reward we talked about earlier with risky options, blocking is going to become more common in your matches. And this is where the main conversation in most fighting games happen. Most people check out as the defender and don't realize they are still playing the game. If your opponent is playing on autopilot using the same predictable block string over and over, defensive mechanics become your best friend. One example we can work with is if your opponent loves the block string of jab, jab, straight, or one, one, two. What you can do if you've been paying attention is you can block the two jabs and then weave the straight punch that you know is coming and land a nasty counter punch. But if your guess is wrong and you weave directly into a hook instead of a straight, you'll take twice the damage. This applies to parrying, mid-string, and street fighter, or insta-blocking in Guilty Gear. Basically, if you are confident after seeing the same shit over and over, you can take a bigger risk to get a bigger reward, but if you are wrong, you take more damage. Another example would be if your opponent likes to close slash, far slash, heavy slash into a special move. You can block all the attacks, wait, and then insta-block the special move for a punish if you've seen your opponent do it a few times. In Storm 4, your opponent might like to do three hits, do a jump attack, and then repeat the string over again. If you've been paying attention, you can block the three hits of the, the combo, and then you can counter, use the counter mechanic on the jump attack. This is a conversation between you and your opponent. So your opponent can change their offense to take advantage of the answers that they think you would use. So for example, if you do, if your opponent does a jab, jab, straight, and you weave it, if they get you into a block string again, this time they might do a jab, jab into a hook where you weaved last time. This is another example of risk versus reward. If you are unsure if the straight is coming, the reward may not be worth taking the risk to weave and be wrong. And so you maybe should hold out on committing to that option until you know for sure it's coming or that reward outweighs that risk. We are all humans with patterns, and some of us are more aware of others about our patterns and try to mask it and bluff it. And this is what's going on in the heads of top tier players when they're fighting each other. They're changing their defensive options based on their opponent's block strings or what they think their opponent is going to do for a block string. Next time you're playing a fighting game and you get caught blocking, try to take a mental note on what your opponent likes to do for their block string. The more aware you become of it, the easier it is to start using defensive mechanics to exploit them. Now let's rewind a little bit. Say you miss the jab in UFC and you don't get the bot string. As your opponent, I will try to hit you in the face or hit you in the body in retaliation. However, in traditional fighting games, if you miss a jab and your hand is out there, I'm going to try to kick the fuck out of your hand. 
Not only can I kick your hand, I can punch or kick your fucking sword and it will still hurt you. This is not intuitive at all to new players in fighting games. And if people were taking counter hit damage from getting their sword hit in real life, I think King Arthur and them would have developed Glocks a long time ago. This is where UFC and traditional fighting games kind of differ. But where they are the same is that when you miss a punch or a kick, there's a small window in which you are basically defenseless. And whatever you get hit with will hurt considerably more. In UFC, you get rewarded with more damage. And in traditional fighting games, you get rewarded, rewarded with a counter hit, which gives you access to a better combo. In addition to what you were doing when you got hit, what you get hit with also matters. Getting hit with a jab is probably not a big deal because your opponent will go through it, still hit you, you will still go through it and hit your opponent. However, big moves naturally are not good initiators or interrupters because they're too slow, but they make amazing punishers. If you see a guy with an attack in front of you, you should aim to hit them with the slowest move that you have that will still connect before they can block. Landing a counter hit with a slow move up close is normally rewarded with even more dramatic rewards, like an extra slowdown or brutality in Mortal Kombat, because that's not supposed to happen. Landing a slow move up close is not supposed to happen. But something slow being used to interrupt or catch something in a small window is supposed to happen even less likely and it's why the game, well fighting games reward you so heavily for doing so. Fighting games are hard, but you don't need a PhD to get started. While fighting games may get ridiculous in what you see on the screen, the developers follow the same main rules when they design them. This balance between speed, power, and range is something we see in real life and that we may understand subconsciously. We know that deciding to kick someone with our leg is going to take longer than if we decided to punch them with our hand, both because it takes longer to get our leg out there and it takes longer to bring it back in in comparison. But that disconnect between how we expect trades to work in our fighting games versus our real life experience can make it really hard for new players to get into fighting games without them even realizing it because it's subconscious. The same way you know to use cover in every first person shooter you play, don't press slow buttons right next to your opponent and look out for conversations in block streams. Doing these two things will get you started in any fighting game you play, no matter how difficult they are. Yo, if you made it to the end of the video, I appreciate you. Please consider leaving a like and subscribing if you want to see what I end up making on the channel next. But I also want to go ahead and give a quick shout out to my little sister and my roommate for the inspiration for this video. And I say in the meantime, go ahead and check out my chip guide. I think it's a good way of getting started to hold you over to my next video. Thank you.